Lives in the darkness Shines with a promise Emmanuel In one child Born in the stillness Living within us Emmanuel Sing His glory Glory Let there be peace Let there be peace Sing His glory Glory Sunday to you, man. Welcome to Church of Addis and our worship service. If I have not got a chance to meet you yet, my name is Pastor Ben. I have the honor and the privilege to serve as one of our six pastors here now. Um, and we're just excited to have you with us as we worship. We're going to kick things off in song together today. So if you would join us, let's all stand together. The words will be on the screen. Let's sing these songs out. I will live for your glory, running with courage. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we just thank you for this new day each day, God, for what you do in our life, for what you do in our families, for what you do, God, in our world. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of it, Lord. So we honor you with this time now, and we do it in Jesus' name and everyone's sake. Amen. It's my honor today. We're going to be baptizing two young ladies from our youth ministry. Uh, I tell young people when they're about to get baptized, I said it's a symbol, first of all, so just like my wedding ring. I made a commitment in my heart first, and then I want everybody to know about it. So it's a symbol to us. You, you, you gave your heart to Christ, and you love your, your heart is taken now. And uh, this is just telling everybody out there that that's what we're going to do. I also tell them it's an act of obedience. It's something that Jesus asked us to do. And you're saying today, we know that nothing magical happens. This, this part of it does not save you. We know that that commitment to Christ saves you. But today, something is happening, and it is, this is their first act of obedience. This is the first thing Jesus asked them to do. And they're saying today that, Jesus, this is how it's going to be for the rest of my life. I'm going to do what you ask me to do. Amen? Amen. 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 The first lady that is coming is Dylan Williams. Uh, Dylan made a decision uh, before we got her, and then she, she came to one of our events. She says, you know what, I need to nail this down and let everybody know about this decision that I made in my life. So, Dylan, have you indeed trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Amen. Because of your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism. 
raise the wall, and give you some love. Y'all don't know the party that's been going on back here, okay? They're very excited about this. All right. This is uh, Brenda Bell's coming down. Uh, Brenda came to uh, Adina Weekend, and she, I think she's about the shyest girl I've ever met in my whole life. And, uh, but, man, the preacher asked him to stand up if they made a decision for Christ, and then he asked him to walk forward, and I'm going, she's doing it, she's doing it. She can't do it. It's like, I, was, I was like, man, this, this bolt of bravery hit her, and I'm so excited about that. So, Brenna, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Amen. Because of your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for you just to continue to amaze us on how you can take a person and change them into a new person. God, thank you so much that we used to be... Uh, God, lost in our sin, we used to be away from you. We used to be an enemy of you, God, and you came and you changed us into a new creation. God, be with these young ladies, be with each of us that are living for you, Jesus, and help us to stand on what we believe. And Jesus, help people to see the love of Christ in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's better than coffee, isn't it? What a way to start off the day, just seeing these things. Well, man, if you're visiting with us today, again, we are incredibly grateful to have you. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are, if you look in the chair around you or in front of you in the back little sleeve there, we have a little visitor's card. And we would just ask if you would be so kind to fill that out for us and drop it in the offering plate a little later just so we can have a, we'd like to meet you and just to know a little bit more about you and you get to know a little bit more about who we are. And just to say thank you for, uh, for joining us. A couple of announcements that we have this morning. Also, if you had a, a handout, if you get one of those handouts, the bulletins on the way in, we put everything going on in church as we have grown, as God has blessed us. We just have a lot of things going on. Amen. But one of the places you can find that out is in those little handouts. Everything that we're doing, all the registrations that you can do, uh, any of the sign-up sheets or just whatever. There's something from this age group all the way to that age group. And I'll leave it at that. Amen. All right, so again, man, we're grateful for you. Thank you for your faithfulness to service. Thank you for your faithfulness to giving. Thank you for your faithfulness just to be the hands and feet of Christ. We're going to continue in song this morning, but before we do that, I would ask you, let's just stand together and to shake the hands to the people to the left and the right of us today. Yeah. Hey. 
this week alone, we've seen so many things that only you can do, and Lord, we just stop and honor you for it. God, we give you our hearts today. We give you our songs. We give you this offering now, and in all things, Lord, we do it with a grateful heart, and we do it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all of God's people say, amen. amen. You may be seated.
Thank you for loving us enough to make a way for us to know you, God, even when we wasn't looking. So, God, we honor you and we give you praise in all things, and we do it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Do I have any runners in here this morning? I'm not either. It's all good. Uh, uh, this morning, I, it's, again, if I haven't had an opportunity to meet you yet, my name is Pastor Ben. I'm one of the six pastors we have here at Church at Addis. Pastor Tom is uh, wrapping up a week of just some downtime he had with his wife, so we want to pray for them as they're traveling today and tomorrow and just coming back into it safely. Things will kind of get back to normal on Wednesday nights, but it's my honor to be with you today. I... I Thinking through this sermon and what I wanted to talk about, I want to dive into a biblical illustration this morning that has really just come to life for me in recent years. The Bible is full of illustrations and different analogies that help us to understand better the Christian life. Things like we're part of the army of God, we're, we're in the battle, 
Things like we're branches and Christ is the vine that we're connected to. We are supposed to be the salt of the earth or the light into the world. All these different analogies that we can kind of see better how to relate to our day-to-day life. But this morning, one analogy that has just become kind of one of my favorites over the past year or two compares the Christian life to that of running a race, to that of being an athlete. Now, I'm not much of a runner myself, as I mentioned, but for the past few years, I've kind of become a track dad, you know? My oldest is running in track and just doing a good job as the Kyle track and field team have a state championship coming up next week. So you guys be praying for them as they prepare and get ready. We had a few, uh, a bunch of qualifiers that are going to be running this week. Um, But the Apostle Paul seems to love using this illustration. He uses it about nine times in his epistles. This morning, I'd like to take a second and kind of just brainstorm with you, if you will, a little bit of the idea of training athletes, drawing from my own personal recent observations and convictions while being at some of these track meets. We had a meet this past Saturday as the regionals, and as I was looking around and just watching all the things that were going on, it's pretty cool how and crazy how God will literally let his active word live out right in front of you and show you his heart and show you his truths if we would simply just be paying attention. So I want to encourage you this morning to just kind of get a good stretch in, right? We always got to start out with stretching. So if you get a good little stretch in and let's get ready as we dive in and search the scriptures and see if we can't pull a couple of good habits out of some of these principles that Paul teaches. So we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you have your Bibles this morning, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul's been encouraging young Timothy to, quote, fan his gift into flame to take and suffer hardships and perseverance with with Paul together, to walk through these things, to persevere through, to push through. And in chapter one, he has just kind of discussed with him those who have fallen away, those who were unwilling to suffer hardships for the gospel. Though he's talked about his own personal endurance through his own sufferings. And he even shared one good example of this guy named Onesiphorus, who evidently died in his service to the gospels. So this morning, we're beginning here in chapter 2, verse 1, if you'll read with me. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardships with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier is active, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. In verse 5, also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. And according to the rules is something you want to highlight there. We're going to come back to this in a second. The hardworking farmer ought to be first the first to receive his shares of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardships, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. For the reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Jesus Christ, and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement, for if we died with him, we also will live with him. And if we endure, we will also reign with him. And if we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Let's pray again. Lord, I just got to ask in this moment that you would speak to us through this word. God, your word that's sharper than a two-edged sword. Speak to us in the way and the place that only you can, God. And we give you the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So how is athletics and training and racing in a track or field or any sport or skill, really, for that matter, comparable to living the Christian life? What insights can we gain into the Christian life from my own experience in training and watching these young students out there on on the track? This morning, I want to look at three principles that I saw this past Saturday. As we watch this track meet unfold, as we watch the students and what they went through, three principles that we can pull from that. As any good athlete knows, everything starts with how you train, right? It all starts with how you train. So let's start here this morning with training. The first principle is this. We have to be consistent. If anybody's ever been a part of training for something, consistency is key. Paul brings out this idea of consistency in verse 5. 
where he says, and I quote, no runner wins the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. In ancient Olympic games, the rules govern not only the competition, but also the preparation. A principle that I've learned over the years as a musician as well is you will always, always perform like you practice. Or in this case, compete how you practice. Athletes had to train rigorously for 10 months or they would not even be allowed to compete for the prize. In training, consistency is everything. On Sunday, September 10th of 1972, a guy named Frank Shorter changed the trajectory of running forever. This Sunday afternoon, 24-year-old Frank Shorter, a law student from the University of Florida, he won the Olympic gold medal in the Olympic marathon while millions of Americans watched on ABC. Shorter's victory was the first by an American in the marathon in 64 years. And combined with the emotional race called by the ABC announcers, it brought viewers to the edge of their seats and inspired many to get up and head out the door to start running themselves. His Olympic gold would be the catalyst for the now called running boom in the late 70s and early 80s. And it helped shape the sport to what we know it to be today. After Frank won the marathon, high school runners everywhere, all over the country, devoured books and articles about him that they could find. They wanted to know about him. They wanted to know what was his secret to success. How did he become what he became? And this new generation of runners, as they read and discovered, they found out that Frank had ran every day for seven years. He did not miss one day in seven years. And what they all learned was that to be a great runner themselves, they had to train consistently because consistently, nothing was going to come easily. One coach put it this way. A runner may say, quote, surely to miss training just this once will not matter. After all, there's a long season of it lying ahead. But to miss training once is to open a breach in the wall of routine. And a single breach will almost certainly be followed by others to the point where there is no routine left. And then bang. There goes your ambition to be a runner. And now this runner's statement is true, the, the coach went on to say, to miss one day will not be a big thing, but missing multiple days becomes kind of a habit. To miss one day in itself is not going to destroy all of your training, but once you've developed bad habits of making excuses and letting days go by without training, then running becomes something that you do when it's convenient, not something that you do because you're a runner. If you stick to your training every day, rain or shine, hot or cold, tired or rested, sore or not sore, beat up or comfortable, then with every step of consistency, it begins to shape and define more clearly who you really are. When I was learning to play the guitar seriously, I found the same principle to be true. I figured that playing a few minutes a day or a few days a week was enough to make me the guitar player that I wanted to be. And in some ways, it was. I kind of let sheer talent become a little bit of an arrogance thing, and I thought I could coast on what I had. But if I started the week missing a few days in a row and only playing when it was convenient or when it wasn't inconvenient for my real life, my social life, then I would always end up missing more than just two days. And playing guitar had become not something that I was doing because I was a musician. It had become something that I would only do when it was convenient. It was a hobby. Something else to just add to my life that was going to fight and compete for my time and my attention. This analogy, I think, applied to the Christian life is perfect. Paul encourages young Timothy again and again, where ones, the, the, the encouragements that he had were ones of emphasizing persistence, making a continuous effort to keep consistency and pursuing righteousness and holiness in his life. He tells him to keep fanning into flame the gift that is within him, to keep on being strong in the Lord. And later in his letter, he would go on to tell him, continue consistently in the things that you have become convinced of. Timothy, I'm sure, was tempted to inconsistency. He was tempted, I'm sure, to give up. He was tempted to abandon the hard work of the Christian life. Think about Timothy's position. Timothy was kind of a young man, and he was kind of left to shepherd and be in charge of a church flock that were full of people who were older than him, wiser than him, right? I remember my first time to preach in big church as this young new pastor and all these older guys staring at me. What do you know? You know, like, what are you going to say to us, young guy? Here's Timothy. I'm sure he was tempted to all those things. I'm tempted to it. 
I know you're tempted to it. We're tempted every day to have these moments of just falling out of our routines. Timothy, I'm sure, had the same thing. We're all tempted time and time again to quit. In Christianity, we don't live happily ever after, after receiving Christ as Lord. Everything tomorrow doesn't just always work out, especially the way we want them to, without roadblocks. Now, in saying that, please don't get me wrong this morning. Knowing Jesus Christ and surrendering to him as Lord has been the single most fulfilling and satisfying thing that I've ever committed to. There's an overwhelming peace, even in the middle of the hardships. There's an overwhelming joy, even in the midst of the roadblocks. But it has been nothing and nothing easy. Christianity is literally walking against the wind of our culture. It's going upstream in the river of a broken world, if you will. Every day after day, hour after hour, we're faced with the option and opportunities to follow Christ or to quit and turn back into our old life of familiar. To follow Christ and do something hard or to walk away and go back to at least what we know. Watching those students run at those meets every second of every practice, you can watch it on their face. The option and the opportunity to quit. Things get tough. Interval day is hard. It hurts. It isn't always enjoyable. But if you push through, it produces a change in the outcome. If they fight through the desire to just sit down and stop running, then the hardship produces stronger muscles. It produces better cardio and better endurance to run further and ultimately to run their, base, their best race. Will they win? Doesn't matter. We're not called to win the race. We're called to simply do our best. Will they win? Not sure, but they will run their best race if they push and they, they practice the way they should. Have you ever noticed if you skip church or skip connect group just once, then the next time it's a little easier? Then the next time it's a little easier and then it, it, you get out of routine altogether and it's kind of hard to get it back. That was one of the devastating parts of COVID when we were all separated out and we couldn't stay in our routines. It was hard to kind of get things back. Some people are still struggling with the idea of getting back into old, old habits. We will, be, we will be consistent in our, de- will we be consistent in our devotional lives? Consistent in our resistance to temptations? Consistent in our pursuit of holiness? Our pursuit in righteousness. One of American track and field greats from the 1930s, Ken Daugherty, he put it this way, quote, run until the question of running, or excuse me, run until the question of not running just never comes up. What if we applied this to our Christian life? What if we applied this to our everyday Christian walk? Read the Bible until the question of not reading the Bible just never comes up. Pray unceasingly and, and until the, the, the thought or the question of not praying just never arises. Plug in and serve with my local body of believers, using all of my gifts and all of my talents for the Lord until the question of not serving just doesn't come up. As much as some of us would hate to admit it, I'm sure we are creatures of habit. And what we do today influences what we do tomorrow. When we are inconsistent today, We make it that much more likely that we'll be inconsistent tomorrow. But when we pursue righteousness today, when we pursue holiness today, we make it that much more likely that we will pursue holiness and righteousness tomorrow. So we gotta remember Paul's principle here. No athlete receives the victor's crown unless his training is consistent. We have to be consistent. Second principle we learn, be disciplined. (laughs) <laughs> Everybody got quiet on that one, right? <laughs> Being disciplined for consistent training to give us the maximum benefit. Athletes have to be disciplined, not just in his or her personal event or sport, but his entire life. A well-trained athlete avoids distractions, must eat well, must get sufficient rest, and must avoid engaging in activities that could result in injury from something else. You know, I, I, I kind of joked this morning, my daughter learned a valuable lesson last week. Track meet was on Saturday, but Friday was spring break. Nobody wants to train and run during spring break, right? We're supposed to let loose and have fun on spring break. Nobody wants to rest and take it easy on the fun day. So instead of resting and preparing for Saturday, she spent all day Friday out in the sun, 
running and jumping on a slip and slide and tucking and rolling and flipping on the four-wheeler, riding in the mud, and it seemed like a good idea at the time. Then came Saturday morning, sunburnt, tired, and sore. And let me just insert in here, like the team and her and everybody, they did a great job. I'm not trying to minimize that. We have some state qualifiers in track, right? But if we're honest this morning, her times and her performance that day was not at the top of what we would consider normal or even full potential. See, if we don't discipline ourselves in all areas of life, we will not get the desired results in any area that we want to. A coach or a trainer may put together a perfect training program and an athlete may follow that training program to the letter. But if they are not eating well, protecting themselves in all other areas that contribute to the overall goal, then we'll never live out to our full potential. We'll never be completely what we were called or designed or created uniquely to be. You see, we have to be disciplined ourselves. We have to discipline ourselves to become what we truly want to be. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25, it says that every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it not to receive a perishable wreath, but we, Christians, that is those of us who have committed ourselves to following Jesus Christ as our Lord, we do it for an imperishable prize. And Paul says in verse 26, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating in the air. Paul compares here in the Corinthian letter, Christians to athletes in two ways. The first way he compares them, he says they both have a goal that defines them. What is our goal this morning? What is your goal as a Christian this morning? Paul shared his goal in the end of verse 23, which is to kind of paraphrase it this morning. He says basically, so that forever and ever I may share in the blessings of the gospel with all of the people who have come to faith through my witness. Should I read that again? What a goal. To share in the blessings of the gospel with all of the people who have come to faith because of my witness. That's a goal. That defines them. And the second thing that he compares Christians and athletes to, he says, but, mo- but both must discipline themselves to achieve the goal. If my goal is to affect all the people around me which I come in contact with, what am I doing on a day-to-day basis to affect them? What am I doing on a day-to-day basis consistently to influence them? Good intentions never wins the race. Good intentions never led anybody to Christ. I have had good intentions and the desire to lose about 30 pounds for six years now. And for some reason, it just won't go away. Good intentions will only give you a direction to go but we have to discipline ourselves to actually achieve the goal. So how do athletes discipline their lives? How do they do it? They exercise self-control in all things. Let's break that down a little bit in, in Christian terms. Paul says, I do not run aimlessly. The word translated here for aimlessly, it literally means one who has no fixed goal. So Paul is saying that he runs with a goal in mind. He is fixed on one point that he's constantly looking at. He doesn't just coast around, kind of waiting for the boat to bump into something in the water. He points at a purpose and he goes after it. He runs straight towards the goal. This is true for every runner. A good coach considers how every step in training works towards achieving the goal. He does not go to the track and does whatever he might feel like for the day. I've, I've, I've watched as Pastor Trom trains our track team. They never just go out and run hard, get sore, take three or four days off, then come back, run hard for a week, then take 10 days off. That would be running aimlessly. There's a specific formula that's made and guarded that is made for a specific purpose to ultimately produce a desired outcome. If we come to a point where we can honestly say that we want our goal to be sharing in the glory of God with those that we have influenced, then we have to discipline ourselves and we have to train consistently. We have to discipline ourselves daily, consistently to get to know him better through personal time of reading and prayer. We have to discipline ourselves daily or consistently to sit under solid preaching and solid teaching. We have to discipline ourselves daily or consistently to put ourselves under a coach or a mentor who can walk with us practically 
and point out things and hold us accountable to things that we may or may not want to be held accountable to. We have to discipline ourselves daily to actually obey the things that we know. You ever get caught up not obeying the things that you know because you're trying to figure out things you don't know? There's a lot of stuff that we already know. Love your neighbor. Love God above all else. Guard your heart above all else. There's a lot of things that we already do know and sometimes we get caught up searching out the things we don't know in the process. We have to train and discipline ourselves daily and purposefully with the goal in mind that is of the highest priority. So that's kind of where the question now comes back to. What is our priority? What is our priority and what is our goal? Paul would say this in verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 9. He says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might be disqualified. The NIV says it like this, I beat my body and make it my slave. The idea is to beat down my personal desires that would distract me from my goals. Paul says that he enslaves his body in the sense of forcing it to do Jesus's will rather than be enslaved by the desires of his own natural self. We have to be disciplined and we have to be consistent. In other words, he makes it a point to prioritize and to be honest about it. He isn't afraid to acknowledge that this place is not our home. He isn't scared to acknowledge that we are not living for the things of the world, rather a future inheritance. I think we forget that. This all seems like quite a big commitment. Is it really that extreme? Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. I think it is that extreme. We have to draw some lines in the sand. We have to separate ourselves from the flow. The scriptures tell us that the road to destruction is wide. If we're doing what everybody else is doing, first red flag. Sometimes we need to be on the narrow road, standing alone maybe, or standing with few. It's a good, good roadmap to check out. Every runner must exercise discipline in all areas of their life where they'll never run at their best. Running the race of faith really has, not, really has so much more to do with just Bible study and church attendance. Running the race of faith affects all aspects, all aspects of our lives. We have to train and discipline ourselves in the selfish desires to be lazy, to waste time, frittering around hours of mindless activities, at too much sleep, even as good, even at the good things. The good things sometimes are less important activities that don't have any eternal value. Nothing wrong with fishing, right? But sometimes fishing is probably not the priority when we haven't seen our kids in a week, right? There's so many good things that we lose contact with. We have to train and discipline ourselves in the selfish desire to overindulge eating too much, spending more than necessary on purchases, waste that is not being a good steward of the things that God has given us. We have to train and discipline ourselves in the selfish desire for acceptance. Out of fear, we don't speak the gospel to our friends or our neighbors or our work friends. We don't live out the holy life that we say we want. We compromise around those things that might make us feel less accepted or pushed out. We have to train and discipline ourselves in the selfish desire for entertainment. We constantly watch movies and videos and share jokes and music and all these things that celebrate the very things that Christ died for. We have to train and discipline ourselves in the selfish desire for comfort. Sometimes we don't even consider going into a hard place or leaving a good job, learning a difficult language. We don't serve and we don't commit to things in the church because that might interfere with our life, with our schedule. We have to be consistent and we have to be disciplined. If our goal is to reach the lost and to affect people the way Paul says, we have to be consistent and we have to be disciplined. The third principle, we have to be steadfast through the pain. Any of my, pa my track parents in here, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> we have to be steadfast through the pain. A good coach tries to make workouts enjoyable, but workouts can never be all fun and games. 
In order to achieve your full potential, hard work is necessary. And that at times, painful. One necessary part of distance runners training is interval work. When runners run intervals, basically they're running a particular distance, let's say a quarter of a mile, then resting for 90 seconds, then a quarter mile, then rest 90 seconds, then a quarter mile, then rest 90 seconds. This allows the body to ultimately run a a cumulative distance, let's say two miles, faster than it would be possible to run without any rest. But about halfway through workouts like this, if you've ever tried to run intervals, it gets hard. Lactic acid, if you're pushing yourself, if you're running the way you should be running, lactic acid starts to build up in your muscles and your legs begin to get stiff and maintaining pace becomes difficult. Maintaining consistency becomes hard and painful. But this is the whole point of the workout. You're teaching your body to run well in race conditions when your muscles begin to get stiff and tired. Completing the workout is key to receiving the benefits. Sometimes in our lives, we have trials and hardships. We have things that we have to go through. We have things that we didn't sign up for. We have things that we don't like. Sometimes we have difficult things to walk through, and sometimes we may not want to do it. But the spiritual muscles, our faith, our understanding, our dependence on God, they start getting stiff and they start cramping and things get hard and heavy. But if we would push and push through those workouts on those days, then God promises that he will use those trials and those difficulties if we love and we trust him, according to Romans 8, 28, to tear down those spiritual muscles, allowing them to start stimulating them back to growth to make them even bigger than they were before, ultimately producing dependence completely on him. James tells us in his letter, persevering through trials makes us perfect and complete, lacking nothing. There's a reason to be joyful during trials. And it's not about being happy in the trial, but it's about finding joy in what the trouble or the trial produces. It's about enjoying the sweet fruit that is only produced in the bitter times. What about when we lose a job and we can't pay our mortgage? What is chemotherapy or a NICU stay, or a bad car accident, or a a real persecution for our faith? What does that really accomplish? Why would James tell us to count it all joy when we encounter trials like those? I believe it is because he knows that when true faith survives the refining fire of life, we will push through the aches and the temptations to quit and walk away when life gets hard. Then the fruit on the other side that is produced will be that much sweeter. A couple things about trials. First one is trials deepen our prayer lives. Trials and hardships will deepen our prayer lives if we let them. When overwhelmed in response to devastating news, in the heaviest of worries, 2 Chronicles 20.12. These are all in your notes. You can check it out later. But 2 Chronicles 20.12, it says, We do not know what to do, but our eyes are fixed on you. Philippians 4.6 and 1 Peter 5.7, Let our requests be made known to, may be made known to God. And cast all of our anxieties, our anxieties on him because he cares for us. Those are good things to remember when we're in trials. Consistent and earnest prayer under heavy trial produces and complete an utter dependence on God. Ultimately growing us stronger in our faith on the other side. The second one, trials grow our knowledge of God's word and our knowledge of his character. In Psalm 119, 71, the psalmist says, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. I've learned things about myself that I never would have known had I not walked through some of the things that I had to walk through. And I've learned some things about God and his character because I've had to walk through some things that I didn't necessarily want to walk through. God will use often work during trials and sufferings to grow our knowledge of his word, and of his true character. The third thing, trials make us more like Jesus. In Hebrews 5, 8, one good thing that God does through hardships is he makes us more like Jesus who, quote, learned obedience through what he suffered. In 2 Corinthians 1, 4, Paul writes that God comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in affliction. Our experience through the trials in life 
sometimes helps us understand what others might feel and what others might need. And from our own experiences, we can come alongside them to pray and to serve them in a gentle manner the way that Christ did for us. And the fourth thing is trials test and strengthen our faith. Trials test and strengthen our faith. Trials prove and reveal to us the genuineness of our faith and strengthen in us in our faith. As the writer would encourage us in Hebrews for, uh, chapter 12, it says, motivate us to lay aside all the weight and the sin that clings so cl- closely to us so that we can run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. You can train as a casual runner and just go out there and jog and build a little muscle, gain a little cardio, or you can let God train you to be the champion like his son, Jesus. The type, this type of training is tough, though. It's going to be painful at times. It's going to hurt a little. And you have, to put it in, you have to put in the work to get the results. We have to walk through the hardships to do the things that it says. Paul tells Timothy, endure hardships with me. In chapter 3, he tells Timothy to expect persecution himself. He makes zero promises that the Christian life will be easy. In fact, he promises quite the opposite. He says the Christian life will be hard and full of trials. But consider the joy when we persevere through the trials because it is perfecting and fulfilling our faith. Amen? The hope and the promise instead of absence of difficulties is that through all of these difficulties, God himself will provide the energy and the strength to overcome through his word and through his instructions if we would simply walk in obedience to them. And as we grow more Christ-like in the process, as we humbly submit and walk in obedience to his promise, he gets all the glory. He gets all the praise. That's the goal. In the end, that's the goal that we're fixed on. The question is this morning, are you willing to put in the work? Are you willing to discipline yourself, making some clear-cut choices to maybe change some things? to put up some boundaries for the sake of holiness. You can't get the most out of the gym, leaving the gym and going straight to the donut shop. We can't leave a worship service and go straight back into our same old life, doing the same old things. We have to allow the things that we gain from the wisdom looking at God's word and let them change us from the inside out. Are you willing to be consistent? Are you willing to endure hardships? To be willing to put up with the pain, knowing that in the end it produces something stronger. I watch some of those kids come out each week and they throw up, they cry, they wince, and they fall out. And they show back up the next day ready to do it over again. They work through sore muscles, and cramps, and sprains, and headaches. And they may or may not win their events. But they always, they always improve from their last race. And that's really the point. So here's the thing, Christianity, it's not about winning the race. Christ already won it. For us in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he simply asked us to run in such a way as to win. Put simply, for me to understand, do your best. Give it your all. Be consistent, be disciplined, and watch what I will do through you. I also watch kids show up each week and they get tired and they walk. They get sore and they sit down. They get discouraged and sometimes even skip practice and ultimately quit. They, as Paul would write, have disqualified themselves. This morning as we close, as as the band comes forward, as we kind of wrap up these thoughts, I'm going to tell you a quick little story as, as we close it out. Roger Bannister is best known as the first man to break four minutes in the mile. Bannister's best moments, though, really happened four months later at the 1954 Commonwealth Games. 1954 Commonwealth Games. In the meantime, the Australian John Landy had broke Bannister's world record. This was the first meeting now between the two runners who had both broken the four-minute mile, the top guy against the top guy. Bannister was known for his fast little kick at the end, so Landy took out a fast pace hard at the beginning, passing the halfway mark with a 10-yard lead. And seeing the gap, many people watching the race thought that Bannister was done. There was no way he could catch and close the gap. Once someone loses contact with the runner ahead of them in a track, especially that far, 
it's very difficult to catch back up. But listen to Bannister's words as he recalled his thoughts at that time. He says, I quote, I quickened my stride, trying at the same time to stay relaxed. I won back the first yard, then each succeeding yard, until his lead was halved by the time we reached the back straight on the third lap. I had now connected myself to Landy again, and though he was still five yards ahead, I tried to imagine myself attached to him by some invisible cord. And with each stride, I drew the cord tighter and reduced his lead. I fixed myself to Landy like a shadow. The result of the race, Bannister ran by Landy in the final straightaway, setting a new world record and winning the Commonwealth gold. He imagined a cord connecting him to Landry and he focused on the runner ahead and he drew himself closer. Our eyes and the same have to remain fixed on Jesus, looking straight at him not looking at the world around us, not looking at the problems we face, not looking at the things, our own past failures or even our own past accomplishments, but focusing only on the Lord, our our Savior, Jesus Christ. Although, along with keeping focus, a good runner has to also maintain form in the race. All through practice in the races, you'll hear Pastor, Pastor Coach Tom as he yells out to him, hands, hands. And what he's doing, in other words, in these moments is he's telling them, straighten up and fix your form, relax. As our bodies tire, the natural tendency is to tense up. Our shoulders rise, our jaw tightens, and it becomes, we become worried that the person behind us is getting too close, and then we get even tighter. The natural tendency for us to do, but this is also counterproductive. When running, the tighter we become, the slower we go. Paul brings this up in the front of chapter four in 2 Timothy when he looks back over his own life and he says, I have fought the good fight. I have fought the good fight. The word good here means aesthetically pleasing. He fought a clean fight. In other words, he maintained his form. He looked good doing it. In other words, he stayed righteous all the way through to the end. He didn't flail his arms around, tightening his jaw, panicking at the person gaining on him. He didn't lean back with his head, but he maintained good form even when the pressure was on. That's how he and Silas could praise God from a Philippian jail cell. That's how he was able to be faithful to his calling even after being beaten and shipwrecked. He was afflicted, persecuted, perplexed, and struck down, but he never was in despair. He never acted ashamed of the gospel. He never lashed back or retaliated at his persecutors. He never started fights with those who disagreed with him. He kept his good form, focusing on Christ in front of him. And this morning, that should be our goal. If we're gonna run the race that God has called us to run, we have to fix our eyes on Christ. So maybe this morning we examine ourselves. Have we even been running at all? It's fun to sit in the stands and cheer on those who are actually running. It's frustrating, (laughs) you know, LSU football season. Go, go, you know what I'm saying? We see all the things that they should be doing. We do it in the church world too. We point out all the things people should be doing, sitting in the stands ourselves. Some people get lost, you know, I I ain't gonna lie. There have been times when I just go to the snack shop and I don't even know what's happening on the track field. In our life, are you stuck somewhere off in the track, not even paying attention to what's going on? Are you diving in, running the race with all your might? Because at the end of the day, that's what Christ died for. He died so that we can get up, get on the track, run the best we can. You may run a 1,500 minute mile, that's okay as long as you do it to the best of your abilities. How do we do that? We stay consistent, we stay disciplined, we stay focused on Christ, and we don't give up, amen? So this morning, let's stand together. The band's gonna play a little bit of a... Thank you for worshiping with us today. I am Pastor Tom Shepard, the lead pastor at the Church at Addis. I pray you were blessed by God's word. If you're watching and would like to become part of this fellowship, there are two options. First. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and today's message spoke to you and perhaps convicted you in some way, I want to walk you through that right now. I will lead you through a prayer in a moment that is going to give you an opportunity to make an honest decision on whether you will choose 
to follow Jesus and make him Lord of your life. This is going to be a defining moment for you. If you desire that relationship with Jesus Christ, bow your head right where you are and repeat after me this prayer. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I know I might not know a lot about you, but I believe that you died on the cross and the blood you shed paid for my sins. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. My past, I am turning away from those sins and I am choosing to surrender to you as my personal Lord and Savior. I believe you were buried and raised again from the dead so that I could have eternal life. And I choose from this day forward to do my very best to follow you. For I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, now my Lord and Savior, amen. Hey, look at me for a second. If you just prayed that prayer and meant it, let me be the first one to say congratulations. You are now a child of God. There is nothing or no one who can take that away from you. In fact, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, that I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above, or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know what else? Luke 15 10 says that every angel in heaven is shouting out for joy right now for your salvation. Isn't that awesome? I want you to do me a favor. If you're close enough, I want you to call us here at the church on the number you see below. I want to sit down with you or zoom you in on a call if you're in another state or country and get some stuff in your hands that is going to take you on the most exciting, fulfilling journey in your lifetime. I look forward to meeting with you, getting to know you and getting you plugged in. Second, if you've already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been baptized as a new believer in Christ but you are looking for a place to call home, all you need to do is email your name, address, and telephone number so that I may contact you via phone or Zoom or visit, whichever is convenient. We will then get you access to our extensive online discipleship curriculum, which is chock full of great stuff for you and your entire family. We will then get a packet out to you telling you all about your membership with your new church family. Accountability and fellowship are so important. Getting connected will solidify your growth and you will create some awesome new friends. I'm so excited about getting to know you and getting you connected on this new journey. Don't wait. Contact us now.